morning, everybody. How is everybody doing today? Uh, so it's Tuesday for anybody who's wondering out there. Uh, I know I've been having a hard time keeping uh, track of the days a week, um, but welcome to our first episode of Coffee Break here on Ocean Stories. Uh, we have been thrilled that so many of our audience have wanted to get to know more how to get more involved. Um, so we thought we would explore the human aspect of these ocean warriors and uh, the roots of their journey. Um, but before we get started, um, a little bit more on what's to come this week. So on Thursday, May 7th, we have Tanya talking about Shark and Ray Love. So it should be super fun and interesting talk, uh, talk on shark reproduction. Um, after that, we have an ocean ambassador workshop to begin your journey into marine conservation and earn your project aware specialty certification. Um, you can sign up on the ocean story schedule. On Friday, on May 8th, we have Dr. Frida Lara coming back to join Jay um, to talk about the Megalodon and other ancient shark species. Uh, and then we'll have a special shark conservation course um, from Project AWARE on Saturday. So lots of cool stuff to look forward to. Uh, and then next week, we're really, really excited to bring a special uh, whale and cetacean week to Ocean Stories. So we have a really, some really awesome talks coming um, from different people in uh, uh, mammal research and um, mammal um, rescue as well. So we're really excited. So check out the schedule next week and get registered for those webinars. Um, so today we have Liz joining us today. How are you today, Liz? Hey guys, what's up? Sorry, I just had to unmute my screen there. Yeah, everything's <laughs> cool. Um, thank you so much for having me back. This is a really, it's a really cool idea. I love it. It's great. I've got my, uh, Got my cup of tea, uh, which you can't really see. There we go. Um, awesome, awesome. Yeah, ready to go. Ready awesome, to go. cool. Uh, so if you tuned in for Liz's ocean story about working with sharks in film and conservation, um, one of our first ocean stories that we had. Um, well, today we are going to get to know Liz on a more personal level. Um, so how this athlete turned shark diver, turned conservationist, got to be where she is today. Um, and so thank you for all the questions that um, some of you posted on social media. Um, we'll get to some of those. Um, and we'll also have a Q&A for you guys to ask qu questions for um, Liz at the end. So let's get started. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. All right. So Liz, um, so you grew up in South Africa, but you didn't grow up uh, near the ocean. So when did you first connect with the ocean? Yeah, so um, like you said, um, I grew up in Johannesburg, which is not only not near any ocean, it's one of the main cities in the world that's not even on a river. So we were high up on a plateau and yeah, no, no ocean for me growing up, but um, we visited the ocean a lot. My grandparents lived on the very sort of south end of Ireland, and uh, we used to travel there a lot when I was a kid. I have a younger brother, and we used to spend our summers there, which was, um, which was amazing. And um, I don't know, I guess just from my swimming career, you know, I grew up as a, a swimmer, and I ended up moving to the U.S. on a swimming scholarship when I was 18. So I'd always kind of drifted towards the ocean. I used to play tennis as a kid as well, but... I don't know, I just, it, it was fun, but it just wasn't like being in the water. And I guess the water is just kind of where I felt most at home. So um, yeah, my, as I said, my family traveled to the, to the beach when we could. And um, so just kind of sort of resonated with me. And um, I guess sort of where your passion lies is where you end up. So that's why I went up, why I landed up in the ocean. Yeah, cool. So then stemming from that, you went to university. Um, and then what did you study um, at university and how has that helped you with the work that you're involved with today? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I get asked every day on social media, well not every day, but a lot from kids saying like, I want to be a marine biologist, like what animal did you study in school? And I didn't actually study marine biology at all. I didn't study anything to do with animals. I went into um, sort of political science, uh, communications, English literature. I'd always kind of thought maybe international corresponding or journalism or I really didn't have an idea. Like, I don't know, I'm not sure about you, but my mindset is, you know, I, 
at the age of 20 years old, I only really cared about swimming. And I don't know, unless you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, or you have a definite plan like that. I mean, you, I still don't know what I'm going to do. So it, it's a hard thing for me as a 20 year old to be like, Hey, here's a piece of paper, fill out your major. This is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. So that didn't really sit too well with me, but I got a degree in political science. And I guess now, um, I, I, you know, it taught me, it taught me a lot about thinking outside the box, thinking on my feet, you know, I can definitely um, come up with some ridiculous things when I need to on camera or the gift of the gab, I guess that would be a polite way of saying it. I mean, look at our politicians now. I mean, that's a pretty firm example of, of that gab that they have. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, so I, I didn't actually study it, but it's cool because a lot of kids ask me about it. And I think at the first, especially your first undergrad, you, it's just, teaching you how to learn and teaching you how to be in the world and trying to find those passions. And I guess it's important that, you know, if you are in a career right now, there's always possibility for change. You don't have to stick with the same thing that you feel that you've studied and you have to do it. I mean, it's all a learning game. And um, I've definitely made everything I have up to this point in my life. And uh, mm -hmm. I guess I, I plan to do it for some time more. Yeah. I think it's super important. I think it's an important concept to know that you didn't have to study marine biology to help make a difference for the oceans. Oh, absolutely not. No, no, no. I mean, I did become a scuba dive instructor and a lot of kids ask me, you know, how did, how do I get to do what you do? And I'm like, well, listen, you don't want to do what I do. You've got to try and think of your own path and your own, the own pattern of way, the, the way you want your life to go. Um, there's no strict way on how I did what I did or you know, I just kind of made it up as I went along and, but I was a dive instructor. So I definitely facilitated and put myself in the position where I was able to um, be around divers and be around the ocean and, and keep the topics relevant to, to what was going on in the world and relevant to my sport. And, you know, you immerse yourself into a community and you're going to feed off that. So yeah. um, I guess that is something that I did along the lines of, of the ocean that I studied, but I mean, yeah you're a dive instructor too. So we all have it. It's not a hard thing to get. <laughs> and, and the most interesting people I've ever met, they still don't know, no matter what age they are, they still don't know what they want to do with their life. They've, you know, had a hundred different careers and, you know, no matter how old you are, no matter what, you know, what you do in your life, you can always make a difference in conservation and ocean awareness because absolutely and for sure people that I know in the adventure world and the exploration world are definitely the ones that, um, are telling the stories at the bar or at the restaurant or at dinner. No one, no offense, but no one really wants to know what happens at banks. It's not very fun. <laughs> I think, I mean, <laughs> maybe it is. I don't know. I think it's funny right now, all the memes of people going into the banks being like, I never thought I'd go up to a bank teller and ask for money with like a mask on. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I kind of think that concept's pretty cool. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, I never thought about that. Um, so what acts as a constant source of inspiration in your conservation work? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. Um, I don't really have one person in my life who I think I don't, I'm not like that one person has been like, I want to be like that person or I want to dive like that person. Um, you know, it's an accumulation of time and exploration and travel and, um, you know, there's definitely been a huge amount of people in my life that have helped me and paved the way for me to be where I am. And I'm eternally grateful for that. I mean, I'm not in a position in a lot of cases where I'm able to sort of give to them what they've given to me. So in my mind, what I, what I like to think is that if I can do something positive for somebody else and sort of pass the torch on that way, maybe that would be a good way of doing it. But yeah, there's no one that is, um, specifically something that I or somebody that I, I I look up to that way but there like I said there are inspirational people and something that has there's an event though that I started in 2013 I think now I started running the the marathons for Project Aware and raising money for shark conservation and ocean awareness and all that kind of stuff and it was the first time because I was a competitive athlete, but I was very much filtered into what I had to do. And I had to swim from one side of the pool to the other side of the pool as fast as I could. Everything was there. I had six coaches on the pool deck. I had massage therapists. I had nutritionists. I had a uniform. I just had to swim fast. That was my job. But being a part of a marathon event, there was like 45,000 people doing it. And the majority of those people are running for a cause. 
and I'm running through the streets of Brooklyn and Manhattan and I'm just seeing for the most part in the beginning it was me overtaking them but definitely towards the end I was standing still and everyone was like passing me it was very demoralizing um <clears throat> But it kind of like, one of the cool things that happened in my brain between the amazing amount of time it took me to do this because I thought, marathon, I can do that, that's easy. No, it's not, just gonna say that right loud, it's not. <laughs> but you, um, you run and you see all these people and they have shirts on and they're, they're raising money for you know, kids with cancer and Parkinson's disease. Ironically, has nothing to do with my family. Um, although I do have doctors in my family, it has nothing to do with my family, um, like MS and, um, AIDS foundation and, you know, Ronald McDonald house and all these, all these charities and I'm running for sharks and, you know, several times I'd be, if people would stop me or I'd like, they'd walk past me at that point and be like, what are you running? What is that sharks? You're running for sharks. And, you know, it was just like casual, like two or three second conversations, like, yeah, sharks are cool. You should raise money for sharks. And so, yeah, I guess maybe an event that sort of triggered my mind. I was like, you know what? I could do more of this and use it as like free advertising and free exposure. Um, and every marathon I've done, I've done several now, many, way too many. I've got two more coming up at the end of this year. Hopefully they'll happen. But every marathon I get someone asking me about sharks, which is, which is really cool. And yeah. And it's bringing awareness to people that are no, you know, that have some people that have maybe have never even been to the ocean, you know, it's bringing. Oh yeah. Running through the streets of Manhattan at mile 26, <laughs> mile 24 is possibly one of the darkest places that you can ever go. <laughs> Fifth Avenue is not cool when you're running the New York marathon at yeah. Christmas time on the other side of New York marathon on, on the other side of Fifth Avenue, but not down that side of, no it's not sucks <laughs> like who is this crazy person running for sharks <laughs> i know they're like what you know better things to do with your time and you're like well no apparently not well, maybe one of those millions of people will go up go and look at right and so that's the key. exactly mm -hmm. if it just if just one person yeah little, Little, little victories. If she's willing to run this far for Project Ocean, surely it must be important. <laughs> right, I know. It must It must affect all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. well, it does, so. <laughs> exactly. Super cool. Really cool. Um, cool. Well, so what's the most influential thing that has happened on your journey that has gotten you to where you are today? Um, something that has shaped you? Uh, or, or would you do anything differently? Um... So yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of, of points in my life where I've sat and reflected on my career path that I've chosen and I've definitely changed stuff. I've definitely taken risks, um, definitely not jumped on airplanes when I should have and got on a different flight or, you know, made the phone calls like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not coming back to work, you know, stuff like that. But <clears throat> I was working in the Bahamas and uh, Discovery came down and we were doing a, a reenactment of a shark attack that happened in the um, Gulf of Mexico. It was um, a kid who was spear fishing and um, had the fish attached to his hip and the, the, the blood was in the water and a bull shark came, bit his leg off. He survives, but the story and the reenactment is one of those like sort of typical sort of lifetime stories where, you know, you get the people acting it out and then the real family come on the TV and then portray the trauma of what happened. And it was horrible. I mean, it was a, a really horrible thing to happen. Um, but, you know, I, I was, involved in this process and I was watching how it played out and a similar time I think Bethany Hamilton the surfer from Hawaii got um got her arm bitten off by a tiger shark and I remember seeing the footage from both instances and being like yeah I mean I understand that they're in the wrong place at the wrong time it's the ocean but these people also put themselves in that position not to say that it's something non it's very significant obviously and I I wouldn't you know, wish it on anyone. I mean, I, I would be scared to be in the position myself. But um, then the fishermen go out and kill like 50 sharks, 50 tiger sharks are killed in, on, the, on, uh, on Kauai. And, um, you know, all these bull sharks are taken out in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's like to find the arm or to find the leg of the shark that may have killed it because it's a rogue shark. And it was kind of like, that doesn't really make sense to me. Like, 
they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and both people, more so Bethany Hamilton, has become a massive advocate for shark conservation and has done a tremendous amount of work in the field and using herself as an example of, you know, it's, it's, she's an amazing ambassador and an incredible human being. And to come back from what she, I mean, she's, she's, a, she's incredible. But it kind of resonated with me because then I'd sit on the boat and go out for shark feeds and people would be like, I'm doing this to like, get my friends super, super scared. And I'm like, but it's not scary. It's like, none of it's scary. And I just didn't understand why people were sort of attaching the two things together, like fear of an animal that, you know, were in their environment, you know, it just didn't really sit well with me. So I think it, in answer to your question, I think, yeah, I think maybe an accumulation of things like that that's happened over time. In my mind, I just sort of was like, you know, it just doesn't make sense in my head why people would have such a, such a negative outlook on an animal and it's not scary like you know and then a friend of mine said well Liz you should tell your story you should put your photos that are taken of you out on Instagram because I get photographers that would come and take pictures of me and stuff and I'd be like yeah people don't want to see that they're not good and they're like no they're amazing and in a short amount of time I, I grabbed a following of people who you know in true social media fashion latched on to cool images and they were the photographers taking pictures of me were were incredible and um one day I was just like, you know what, maybe this would work. Maybe I could use what I love to do to educate people and make it more relevant for them to see it because they can relate to me. I'm a human. They right. can relate to the ocean. They can relate to a shark. But if you combine that all together in a ball, people are like, wow, that is crazy. And it is crazy, but it, it's not dangerous. It's not, you know, it's an understanding. It's a respect and it's a level that, you know, you, you, you learn over time. And, and that's kind of what I've done. Right. Using imagery to you know, change that perception that's been created. Absolutely. Yeah, it's super. It's, I mean, I look at our world, everything is visual. Like right. yeah. no one watches a video for more than like two and a half minutes. I mean, I can say I don't really do that or no one reads magazine articles in quite the same way that they used to. It's all about right. that visual impact that like instantaneous satisfaction to their brain. And um, yeah, I have amazing people that have taken cool photos and um, if we can use those as tools, like, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, really yeah. cool, really cool. Um, and what, what is one of the biggest uh, challenges that you faced in your career and how did you overcome this? So, um, yeah, that's, you know, there's challenges in every field that you work in. Um, being in the dive community and being in the film community, it's definitely a male dominated society. Um, I always get fired up a little bit <clears throat> when someone asks me this just because, um, I was teaching the one day and actually when you sent me some of these questions and I was looking through them and I was like, Oh wow. I could feel my heart rate. <laughs> when I read this question. There was this guy, I was a dive instructor in the Bahamas and uh, my doc manager, Alvin at the time. So that's Stuart Coves in the Bahamas, which is a, a great place to go and dive. Mm -hmm. um, he had said to me, um, I was on the schedule to teach that morning. So I was like, great. Yeah, cool. I've got a kid. I love kids. They're awesome. They have no fear better than adults great yeah. um so I went down the dock and he's like Liz you that's your your kid over there this is dad and I was like sweet so grabbed my bag went over it's like can't remember his name but went up to the dad and was like hey I'm Liz I'm gonna be your kid's dive instructor today are you coming out with us like did and he just kind of stopped and looked at me and he was like you're his dive instructor and I'm like yeah yeah I just want to make sure that you guys have all your gear we can jump on the boat I would need to go over a couple things and he's like listen before you go too much further if you could just stop, he's like, don't take this personally, but um, I would feel a lot more comfortable if my son was taught by a man, because I just really think that they have more strength and ability in the water. So I remember standing there and I, I was like, it never happened to me before. I mean, this was like, I grew up in Africa where racial discrimination is like, was a huge part of my growing up. I mean, it's, it's, but even talking to you now, I can just feel my blood level <laughs> rise. I was like, I'm sorry. I'm like, sorry, what? And he's like, yeah, he's like, don't take it personally. I was like, okay, well, first of all, how am I not going to take that personally? And then second of all, he was like, yeah, I just, I just don't think that women are, you know, as capable as men. So at this point, my doc manager, Alvin, knew that there was a problem because I, I kind of like just was standing there staring at him. And so I turned to Alvin, who's a Bahamian guy, and I told him the story. And Alvin, super cool dude, he just kind of was like, okay, sir, no problem. Look, well, you know, and it, it's a fan. Totally respect your, if that's what you want. And 
the coolest thing happened a couple days later when he was certified and he went out with an instructor who was a new instructor. He was taught by a really cool guy, but I uh, went out on the boat and I was their shark feeder. So I was like, yeah, you go there, buddy. And I was like, he's like, you feed sharks? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm kind of qualified for the Olympics in swimming too. So peace out. Have a great dive, buddy. <laughs> Smile when the camera comes close to you. I'll get in a photo with you or something. But so yeah, th I, I, that's just a little side note, but it's a story that always comes to mind. And as we're chatting over coffee, it's something I feel like I can share. I wouldn't normally share that story. But yeah, I mean, the ocean is an amazing leveling ground. And um, when it comes to water, and I've learned this a lot in life from the career that I work in now to, um, you know, being a dive instructor and being a swim coach, you know, everything I've done in the water, when it comes to the ocean um, and it comes to water, someone can pretend that they're as amazing as they possibly can, guy or girl, but the minute they either put their gear on or jump in the water and I see them in the water, I'm like, oh, okay, it's going to be a rough day or okay, they're all talk, or okay, this is going to be surprising. They're actually going to be able to do this. So, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to ego, which is a huge thing in our industry, I think it's a huge thing everywhere, but yeah. we do have that one little bit, which people on land don't have. And that when someone enters the water, I know immediately if it's, if they're lying to me or if they're not. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, there's our challenges. There are challenges everywhere, but that one always stood up in my mind because it's the first time that that effort sort of happened to me. I'd always been I was just, it was, it was a shocking experience, but yeah, so it's just I one of those things. life happens and you just yeah. blow over and I just smile and I hope the kid's a great diver and I hope him and his dad are having awesome diving adventures. <laughs> I right. hope that, I hope their perspective has changed because I, I agree. I mean, the water is a, is a great leveling field and it, it is, it goes to show that it doesn't matter what your gender is. It's, it all comes down to experience. Like you said, you can talk all that you want, but as soon as you get in the water, you know exactly what someone's knowledge and experience is based on how good they are in the water. Yeah. Because the water is going to show everything about that person. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, down to their experience, not <clears throat> what their gender is, not how strong they are, not anything like that. Okay. It's how experienced and how knowledgeable they are. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've <clears throat> swum on teams and I've been around every shape, color, flavor of everyone. And, you know, I'm, it's it's crazy and i i just think that you know the more worldly people are people who travel and experience stuff and you just gain more experience that way but yeah when people ask me about that that's the one story that sticks out of my head and it's still just oh really frustrated me but hey it is what it is move on life's too short <laughs> and, uh, lauren says i would not want to be the man to tell liz uh can't do anything better than a man I agree. With oh, well, that's so nice. I mean, there are some things, don't get me wrong, for sure. Absolutely. Like, I'm not a, like one of these feminist activists that stands up in the Oscars and says there's no like women nominees or whatever. <laughs> I, you know, you earn your place. I, I grew up in a world where, um, um, you know, not everyone's a winner. Like you go out on a field. I worked in, I, I worked in, I uh, worked, I, I did a sport that if you get to the wall first, you win. You, you're, you won there was no like okay we're all the team players we're all going to win together everyone's harmonious and you know we're all going to get medals and flowers and trophies and I, I just never grew up in that kind of a community and I think mm -hmm. that that sort of um has resonated through my life and I'm the first person I'm the first person to be like hey look you know what and having worked in the stunt industry as well like I've been in situations where I've been like you know what or even not so much the stunt industry but with sharks where I'm like hey guys we need to just catch ourselves for a minute. Like this is just sort of blown out of proportion. And I don't think that either I'm the right person to do it or I'm not afraid to say I can't for sure. Yeah. No, and when it comes to the ocean, I think it has that level of respect, which we have to have. Yeah. And so but anyway, yeah. Cause it's more powerful than anybody human. It doesn't matter your man or oh woman. It can, go, <laughs> it can go from those amazing Instagram shots to your worst nightmare. Yes. And and you add to that, and it, there's no seconds. It just goes from really good to really bad, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. But they don't show that on Instagram. That's the problem. No, 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 no. Those get blocked, or you get hate mail, which yes. I get a lot of as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, cool. So the next question, oh, Annie also says, very cool story, Liz. So That's awesome. my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. Um. So at what moment did you realize you accomplished something great or you were making a difference? You know, you have that like aha moment where you're just like, 
this is all starting to come together for you, you know? Yeah, yeah. So my buddy Terry um, that I worked with in the Bahamas, she's an Aussie chick. She's really rad. And um, she was the girl who, standing on the dock was there, was like, Liz, you should like put some of your pictures on Instagram. And I was like, yeah, I don't really know how Instagram works. And she's like, well, just do it. So I did. And the growing followed, the, the following grew and grew and grew. And um, I mean, my Instagram is very specific to a very small part of my life. Like I do have other stuff going on. I do other adventures, but I love the medium because it is visual. And I think sharks are need that, that, that kind of help when it comes to um, getting the word, the positive word out about them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's been a couple instances where I never did any of this to like gain any kind of fame or, you know, I've gone to dive boats and like, Oh, you're Liz Parkinson. I'm like, yeah, I guess so. And I'm like, yeah, you know, a whole bunch of people like me on Instagram. That's cool. But you know, I, I, I do what I do because I love it. And, and I want to share my love with a lot of people and I love, you know, with people and coffee talks and all that kind of thing. But um, anyway, so I was running in one of the marathons that I was doing and <laughs> it's really embarrassing, but I was actually walking at this point and not only was I walking, but I was on my phone bitching to someone that I was dying. Um, I must just reiterate that I am a sprinter and not a distance person, mm -hmm. but I do, if I can run a marathon, there's no excuse for anyone. So um, I just taken my phone out and I put it back in my pocket or in my like little pouch thing or whatever. And I was like, okay, Liz, nine and a half more miles to go. Come on, you can do it. Like, okay, gel, 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 glug, glug, glug. And, and off I, I was, it was a sl it was a very sh um, slow trot, I should say at this point. But there was this girl standing on the side of the road and she literally like reached out and touched my arm and she's like, oh my God, you're Liz Parkinson. And I'm like, what? And she's like, you're the chick that does shark stuff. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, that is so cool. I cannot believe that I found you. I'm like, there's 40,000 people running this race. And I happened to just walk at that one Pacific point that someone who I never met in my life before put her arm out and was like, oh my God, you're Liz. And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Um, and it was great. She was like, I follow you on Instagram. My kids think you're rad. I love what you do. Go, go, go. And I'm like, thanks. Are you, sure you don't want to sit down and chat for a little bit? Cause I'm quite happy to do that. But, um, that was, that was a cool point. And then one other time it happened, um, I was in Northern Norway in this town and I, I, I don't really know the pr proper Norwegian, um, pronunciation, but it underness, I, it's a town up in, you know, quite far north of Tromsø, uh, Fort Tromsø, or it's, anyway, it's northern Norway. And uh, we were sitting, my friend Nadia Ali, who's a, who's an underwater photographer, yeah. I'm sure everyone knows really well. She, she took actually a really similar photo to the one that's behind you. I think she was on that trip with Jay when they took those images together. Yeah. And uh, yeah, she just won this cool award for it, which is, which is really rad. Um, but anyway, we were sitting at this little restaurant. It was the only restaurant in this town where there's no light. I mean, there's no light at all. It's dark all day long. And we were being served by a chick who was there, who lived in Jacksonville, Florida. Wow. Okay, whatever, whatever. So we're sitting there and this, this like, there was a table, like three, four tables down from us. It was like a troop of kids. There's probably like four or five of them. Yeah. And we're eating our dinner. And um, I think we were with Greg Leclerc. He's another really famous um, um, photographer, under, French underwater photographer. And we were just chatting about the orca. We'd been, gone up there to do the orca and the fin whale. And we were like chatting about our day. And this girl comes up and like taps me on my shoulder and she's like, are you Liz and are you Nadia? And we both kind of looked at each other. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she's like, oh, hi, I'm, and I can't remember her name, but she's like, this morning on Instagram, I woke up and my friends and I saw that Nadia and Liz are in underness doing orchid. There must be something cool happening. So they drove from Sweden to Norway and booked on our boat so that they could come out and experience the ocean. They're like, we would never have done this if you girls didn't promote the underwater environment the way that you do so I was like hey man wow. that's really cool like I I don't know if that I mean it doesn't affect everyone in the same way but I was like wow and I subsequently met her again in Chicago she'd become a dive instructor so there's been little moments like that which have happened over my life and I'm just like you know what that's really cool like if I I didn't realize that the influence went that far but you know obviously I'm doing something okay so yeah that was that was a really cool moment for me I was like wow, thanks for, you know, thanks for coming out and, and joining us. It was, it was really cool. cool. That's yeah. super cool. I love that. So yeah. the, that first race, though, you know, after she gave you that burst of encouragement, 
you obviously sprinted and won the race. Yeah, I totally won it. Yeah, I won the whole thing. Uh, if you look at me, like 2013, I think it was Chicago. Yeah, I'm right up there. I'm going to finish. Yeah. That's yeah. what I thought. Just, just wanted to let the audience know, you know. Thank you. Yeah, and I really appreciate that. As an athlete, it's uh, it's a big ego point. I hate to lose. So, yeah, I was right yeah. up there with uh, with the winners. I didn't come crawling in at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Swearing I would never, ever do a marathon again. I think I've done, like, 10 since then. All the sharks. Wow. So, um, anyway, awesome. yeah. Very cool. Really cool story. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um. What is, what have you found is the most difficult thing about conservation? Um, there's so many challenges about it, but what, what do you think is the most difficult thing about it? And on a more positive note, what do you like most about conservation? Yeah, well, conservation's hard. It's hard work. Like, it's not an easy thing to do because there's a lot of haters out there. There's a lot of people who, um, you know, there's people that know that stuff's happening and that there's a reason why there's conservation. But I think especially for the ocean, which is so surprising to me, because it covers most of our planet and it is so, it is, most of our oxygen comes out of the ocean. A lot of our food source comes out of the ocean. A lot of the health of our planet is because of the ocean. And um, there's so many people who are like, yeah, we know there's a problem, but you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. There's way more relevant things that we have to worry about. Like, you know, stupid stuff like who the president is and things like that um so yeah so it's like which is important i know but in a different kind of way and it's just it's interesting how um people don't seem to understand how important it is so the negativity is that it is very hard you always feel like you're doing one step forward and then sort of five or six steps back but then the positives are those one little step that jumps forward or something does happen or you have an event like i've just mentioned where someone does something amazing or extraordinary or texts you or emails you and is like, Hey, so I've put together a nonprofit. I'm working towards this. Um, I go to schools every day or every once a month. And I, I talk to kids about whatever it might be. It doesn't have to necessarily be about the ocean or sharks. It can be, you know, there's a huge problem with bees right now in the world. And there's a huge problem, right. obviously, you know, global warming is such a huge topic, but like, you know, the melting of the icebergs, clean water, um, vibrant soils. I mean, there's so many different aspects that you can pick from. It doesn't have to be ours, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it is tough. It's a lot of work. You get very little, I think, for what you put into it. So it definitely has to be a passion. Um, right. For sure. Yeah. I agree. And it, and it just also shows like, you know, that, you're not alone sometimes like you like go into the ocean and you're like oh my god this is so amazing and then you come out and you realize like thousands and hundreds of thousands of people feel the same way and they're passionate enough about it to you know spend oh my god. their yeah. time and money fighting for it so it's and like, there's amazing people out there that do it i mean yeah. conservation stems so much further from you know sitting at a desk trying to drum up awareness people do it in all different kinds of way i mean there's there's artists there's authors there's scientists there's um documentarians i mean musicians there's so many people that do it in their own way there's not one right way to be involved in conservation and it's interesting because like i have mentioned there i get haters on my social media and i you know people take pictures of me with sharks and you know, sometimes they're, you know, all different. And it, it's purely up to what the photographer wants. Like sometimes they'll come and say, I want you to do this. And I'm like, okay, cool. And if the image is cool and I like it, I'll put it on my Instagram. It may have nothing to do with conservation, but it's amazing how many people will then comment and be like, what does this photograph have to do with your, your fight in conservation? I'm like, well, it has nothing to do with it. It's just a really cool image. And they're like, oh, you just want to get likes and followers on Instagram. I'm like, no, actually at the moment, my Instagram is full of has fallen dramatically over the past like two months because mm. I'm not in the ocean like you. I'm stranded on land. Like I'm not diving with sharks. I'm not, you know, so it's got nothing to do with that. Like yeah. that stuff is, it doesn't matter to me, but that. The, a lot of the hate I do get hate because oh you're not this is you're touching a wreck or you're standing on sand or you know you did this you don't know what you're talking about like da 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 and most of the time I just ignore it because it's not even worth my while and some of the times I you know if they get pretty violent on it you know I have a, a really cool and I know some people are watching right now a really cool base of followers who one guy had a photograph of me on a wreck that a buddy had taken and um his, my buddy alex took it and um i was in a bathing suit but i had like this material wrapped around me and 
Um, I'm not really one for doing those kind of shots, but he wanted to do it. So we went out and we did it and um, I post it. And this guy like launched into me that I, you know, I'm using the platform for something that, you know, I'm fake and all this stuff. And the amount of my followers that jumped on him and was like, dude, if you look at your Instagram account, we know what you ate for like the whole of last week because all your photos of your food. Like, that's really cool. And if you, you know, if you want to be a food critic, awesome. But do you really know what you're talking about? Like, you know, it's really easy to hide behind like a name on social media or something like that. And, right. you know, I don't really care. It doesn't bother me. But, you know, kids watch it. And I've had friends who's, who said, hey, my kid saw this photo and someone made this nasty comment. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm sorry. And then I delete it. And then I get hate for deleting it because then I'm fake too. So, but then that's just a small increment of it. There's a huge vast world out there of people who, who are really supportive and have my back. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is the world that we live in. So. Right. Right. Um, well, we, we have, like I said earlier, a lot of our audience has reached out and just expressed like a amazing concern about just wanting to get involved in, um, conservation. So if you could, um, give, some advice to aspiring conservations um, in this current political environmental client uh, climate. What would what advice would you give? Well, you for sure. Number one, you have to find something that you're passionate about, and right. you have to be yourself. Like I said earlier, people text me or or Instagram me or whatever and say, you know, I want to be, I want to do what you do. And I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of tough because um, there's no real path that I've laid out that you know, there's a lot of women who do amazing things. You should try and find your path and your way of doing it because there's no right or wrong. There's no wrong way to do it. Like everyone has their talents. Everyone has their speciality and use your talent to do this. I can swim and I can hold my breath. Well, that's minuscule compared to what other people do in conservation. And I aspire to be like them, which keeps me going because it's like, wow, all these incredible men and women out there who are doing amazing things. So you've got to find something that you're passionate about, number one. And you've got to be prepared to know that you're not going to make a lot of money from it. Like conservation is not a money maker. Like if you want to, my best advice when kids ask me, I said, if you love the ocean, get into diving. Do your open water certification through Patty or whatever your your thing is. Um, um, I just say Patty because they're awesome and they're the best and I love them. So, um, but yeah, you can you can um, you know do become a diver and then if you want to go into conservation, you have something that you're super passionate about. Do a degree in school that will facilitate that, like a business or marketing degree or a communication degree or some kind of science degree that's going to help you support yourself while you do it because only that information is going to help if you just say i want to be a conservationist well that's like saying i want to learn everything there is to know about global warming it's like a massive topic you've got to break it down so yeah i would just say follow your passion and there's no right or wrong way to do it you just have to be super persistent at it and um just give it give it all you got if, if that's what you love yeah i totally agree great 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 advice um so there, there's currently a lot of controversy over chumming and feeding sharks, um, yeah. but it is necessary to capture a lot of the images and to give that um, to give that perception change that we were talking about earlier um, that we were talking about. So, what is your opinion on this issue? Um, Cool. So that's like, that's like a four hour conversation right there. But in a nutshell, schedule another coffee break soon. <laughs> um, in, so yeah, I mean, con shark feeding is hugely controversial. And like I said, I, I hear about a lot through many platforms. Um, you know, the, the, the best example that I can give that I've given before and will continuously give is in the Bahamas at Stuart Coast. We used to, I, I used to do a shark feed dive every day. And um, about eight or nine years ago now, a PhD study was being done where um, the now doctorate, uh, Dr. Alex Malkovich from Simon Fraser, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver was seeing the effects that shark feeding had on the population and the effect on the ecology of the reefs surrounding. And so we went out for three years and we had all these tags and all these things and this whole big thing. It took her three years of research to get what she needed. And basically she came out at the end with the, the facts that were laid out from her data that the ecology of the reef surrounding where the shark feeds happened was far superior than anywhere else around Nassau where either the fish had been fished out or the sharks had been fished out. This population of sharks sustained the environment surrounding it. Now, 
you don't typically find 30 reef sharks in one area. It's not normal. So that also comes into question. But if you think about it on a, on a huge global scale, what do they say? 100 million sharks are killed a year. You know, 500 sharks are killed every minute. Whatever the statistic is, it's massive. If you take 30 sharks that are fed on a daily basis off the Bahamas and no one seems to have too much of a problem with 100 million sharks. They may care, but they're going about their day, getting their Starbucks coffee and worrying about what, you know, the, you know, whatever's happening in their lives. 100 million sharks to kill a year, out of sight, out of mind. But the minute an image is put forward of someone shark feeding, you're like, if we can use, and I hate to use the word use, but if we can, if we can have these animals as ambassadors to their species and use them to promote shark conservation, use them to promote scientific study, use them to, what is 30 sharks are killed every 30 seconds. So what does it matter when there's a hundred million are being killed a year? And there's various different locations around the world where these studies have been going on and we've learned so much from them. So yes, in the areas that I have dived with sharks and they do put food in the water, in, the, in Nassau, it must, you know, we don't, they didn't chum the water, it was individual pieces of bait. Mm -hmm. And there's other master studies going on that surrounds this whole topic too. Um, and so I would put a picture of me shark feeding and I never put anything up that I wouldn't support. Like I do what I do because I, I do it number one, because I, I represent it and I'm proud of it and um, I stand by it. Um, but also it, it lights people's imaginations. And, you know, I get people who ask me all the time, like, you know, I don't agree in shark feeding. You should never feed wild animals, da, 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 da. It, it, it is, it, I understand that and I always appreciate, and you know, thank you for your opinion. But an analogy that I can tie to that, which I think we've spoken about, mm -hmm. is <clears throat> I always say to them, okay, well, look, I understand what you're saying, but put that aside for the minute. And then I say, do you enjoy snowboarding and skiing? And they'll be like, uh, yeah, why, what does that got to do with sharks? I'm like, okay, so where do you go? Where do you go? And they're like, oh, you know, we go to Montana, we go to Colorado, we go to Utah. I'm like, it's awesome. I love it. I love skiing and snowboarding. It's amazing. And I'm like, so you go for like, what, two or three days a year, a week? Like, yeah, I'm, you know, we have a family trip there once a year and we take my kids and they're learning on the slopes and it's so cool. And have you done this bowl or that bowl? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. I'm like, okay, cool. So that's awesome. But do you also realize that these ski resorts have destroyed the face of these mountains for you to ski? And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, you, you think that that's all natural? It's like fake chemical snow that's being pumped on those mountains every day. You don't think you've displaced the moose and all the bears that live in that area? A bear walks onto a ski resort and it's shot. Like, it's the same kind of thing, but it's different in the same way. So trying to help people understand it from a different perspective that they can relate to sometimes helps that argument. And so um, I don't have all the answers and maybe what we do is not 100% right but it's definitely way better than the massacre and the destruction of what's happening in our oceans. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous what's happening. So I think 30 sharks would be super proud that they can represent their species. Yeah, I agree. Where, wherever we go, whatever we're doing, we are altering the environment, the, the natural environment that we are, you know, enjoying in some way or the other so yeah, sure. we can do it in a way that's benefiting other species or we can do it in a way that is minimal you know minimal impact or it's helping in the conservation of a species then you know all the better for it you know it's, yeah. it's like you said it's 30 sharks or no yeah there's no one correct answer to that it's a really loaded question and i totally understand it like i don't think that people should go into hunting areas and bait up an animal and then sit there and shoot it. I think that's right. horrendous, but it's not the same thing. And um, it's just education and, and knowledge. And, you know, sometimes I've, I've said to people, look, instead of bashing me on social media, message me or email and I'll send you these papers, which prove what I'm saying. Yeah. And on top of that, only like 40, maybe 30% of the people will come back and message me privately. Right. And on top of that, one woman who was a massive hater, she actually came to the Bahamas and died with me. And she's like, wow, Liz, you've really changed my life. And I'm like, wow, that's yeah. really cool. That's, that's really why I do it. If, there's one, if it takes one person out of a thousand people or more, then yeah. And that's great. Maybe my, my account on Instagram was worth that one person. So that's awesome. That's really cool. Really yeah. cool. And, and all about the, how it's done as well. I mean, there's responsible people out there doing it um, because they want to help change people's perception of sharks and there are operators that are in it for the money. They want, you oh, know. Oh yeah, but that's human nature. That's, 
yeah. that's everything that's done and everything that we do even during the coronavirus. Exactly. <laughs> there'll, be there'll, be, there'll be opportunists that buy all the Lysol wipes from Costco yeah. and then try and sell it for $10,000. And you're like, really? Did you? Yeah. you? That's nice. Exactly. Um, so what are your top three shark diving locations on your bucket list that are still on your bucket list? That are still on my bucket list. Um, so there's a, oh, wow, I actually have quite a few. Um, there's some good spots in the South Pacific that I'm keen to go to. Um, there's a couple spots around the UK up in Scotland that I'd like to visit. Um, I haven't done a lot of um, diving in South Africa, excuse me, although I have done white cage or white cage and also out of the cage, which um, was a fun experience um, with the sharks down there, but there's a lot of different species of sharks. Um, one of the coolest spots that I've dived with sharks is actually not only the Bahamas, but off the Florida coast. There's a huge amount of shark species down there. And there's a lot of really cool phenomena that happen because of the bathymetry of the ocean floor and how it meets at certain points where they use that, um, the Gulf Stream and the nutrients that flow in the Gulf Stream to get, you know, the big fish and stuff. So, yeah, um, there's several places that I would still like to go specifically to see specific species. I'd also like to dive up in Alaska. I think that... Um, the salmon shark are on my list of yeah definitely yeah. definitely i know you i know you've been diving in cabo and um with the pelagic sharks here in bahamas yeah it was amazing yeah we came out with um you guys and with um cabo shark divers and we went out and we did the mako sharks and the blue sharks um, and um it was it was awesome it was really cool it was like um and it was similar to diving with the the oceanic white tips where you're in the ocean, the middle of the ocean. I mean, we're super deep and super far out and you get these little Mako bullets like zooming in and out. It was um, yeah. super cool. I think my happy cool. place. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and next to Tiger Beach, probably my most favorite shark diving in the world would be um, in Australia. There's like a little little yeah, rock Australia is great. There's a lot of cool shark diving in Australia. Yeah. Really yeah. Well, cool. there's like a little rock pinnacle um, like just south of the Great Barrier Reef um, where they have like you can see like 50 to 100 ragged tooth sharks, like all congregated together. Okay. And like manta rays and a super insane. Like I always, like one of the top three diving, shark diving sites in the world. In my yeah, when you, when you see that shot of what I can imagine you're looking at, there's, I mean, the land is cool and there's some cool stuff to see on land, but the ocean has just got so many amazing things to yeah. Uh, see yeah um so what's one of the most unforgettable special encounters that you've had underwater and why okay cool so yeah i have um <clears throat> and i think it probably stems from like so i don't know i'm sure because of social media everyone's seen that the bioluminescence off the coast of california right now especially southern california is is pretty wild um we're getting these like electric blue waves because of the it's a type of plankton that lets off the bioluminescence when it's activated with the water movement and um yeah it, it's hard for me to pick up one thing because there's been a lot of dives and there's been a lot of you know regulator falling out of mouth experiences but um, there was this one time I was in Nassau, actually, I was, I was feeding, um, sharks at Stewart Coves and, um, we had just done something for Good Morning America and it was a night shot with sharks and we were trying to investigate this and see what it was like. And, um, you know, they were like, do you want to go feed at night? I'm like, uh, yes. So there's a whole bunch of new people and some photographers there that had been there doing some stuff for the Bahamas. And so we went out. And it was dark already when we hit the water <clears throat> and um, I had the bait box and I had my chainmail on and I jumped in the water and all the sharks were swimming around and we all felt, we all fell down out of water. And I didn't think about it at the time because I was holding the bait box and I had the, the feeding spear and I was like, you know, I had 30 sharks swimming around me and it was dark and I couldn't really see them. But then the camera guys got in the water with their big strobes and they were shining on me. So I was like, Oh yeah, this is great. And they illuminated the whole area and it was beautiful. And you could see all the shadows of the sharks. It was like Megalodon swimming over us. It was so cool. And then one of the guys was like, hey, there's something wrong with my camera. So um, he's like, I'm going to go up. So I'm like, okay, cool. Didn't really think too much about it until like about 10 seconds later when the light disappeared and they took the light with them. And I didn't think about it at the time. I was like, oh my God, I'm standing in 40 feet of water in the middle of a sand circle with a bucket full of fish, dead fish, that's all seeping out and melting into the water. And there's like 30 reef sharks swimming around me. And so... 
I was like, it's fine. And my eyes were still, it was dark because I, I, I had had the, the strobe light in my face. So I couldn't really tell. But as my eyes started to adjust to the, the moonlight and the stars coming through, it was like this really surreal feeling that I got. It was like, I'm in the safest place in the world right now. No one can touch me. I have 30 bodyguards swimming around me and I'm in control of that because I have the bait. And um, we, we were standing there for quite a while, actually. There was something wrong with the camera. And the shark started to swim fast and burst in and out. And then they were getting excited. And they, their temperament moves up and down when you feed them because they, you know, they swim pretty chilled and then they get excited. And I was trying to keep them around. So I was tossing a bit of bait out. And they kept, they hit the box and they were swimming. And it happened, it must have just been the way the current was moving. But all of a sudden, as the sharks were swimming, they were like illuminating. They were like, Tsharp. and it was like this trail of like sparkling lights behind them. And they were igniting the bioluminescence in the water. And because I, my eyes had now adjusted. I could, I could kind of make out what was going on, and <clears throat> and it was like Fantasia. I had thirty reef sharks sparkling around me. I was like in the best Disney movie that I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, it puts the Little Mermaid to complete shame, mm -hmm. and it was the cool. It was one of the coolest things. And when the guy, I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. This is amazing. And I started to feed more, and I like had the little fish, and there was like a lobster walking across the, and everything was sparkling because everything was moving really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my god, the guys have to see this. It would be so cool. And then as soon as they jump back in the water, broom, they put the light back on. And because the bioluminescence happens all the time, but you can only see it like the northern lights when it's dark, um, they missed it. So I had this private Fantasia Disney experience in 40 feet of water with 30 animals that I absolutely love in the spot that makes me the happiest. And I was like, you know what? This has been a really, really good dive. So yeah, that was a really good moment. <laughs> uh, I would say that's definitely unforgettable. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty rad. I wish, I, I wish I'd had some kind of video, but yeah. I just have to stick with the, the, the one that's in my head for, for now. Yeah, I wonder if you could like really capture that though. I mean, it'd be hard. It would be hard, yeah. You'd have to, um, I, I don't know, I'm not that good yeah. of a photographer, but. Um, but I mean, glowing I sharks, that'd for sure go viral. <laughs> yeah, glowing sharks would definitely, definitely get my Instagram account skyrocketing for a time. Yeah. Definitely. That's super, yeah. super cool. Wow. Um, well, you guys, if you guys have any questions for Liz that you want to ask, um, you can pop them into the Q&A box. Um, but um, for until we get some more questions going, if you guys have any questions, like I said, just put them in the Q&A box. But um, if right now I know we're all stuck stuck inside. I know you're in California. Um, another question that we had on the Instagram was, if you could be anywhere right now, where would you be? Wow, anywhere in the world? Yeah. I don't know, maybe I'd be on a night dive somewhere with like 30 great whites swimming around me. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, don't know. I mean, you know, I'm, it's pretty exciting because, you know, I haven't really lived a whole, I mean, I have been living in California for a while, but I've been working um, on some films, so I haven't had the ability to explore the ocean as much as I want to and the species of sharks out here are pretty insane. I mean California's got some amazing ocean and although it is a bit cooler and the visibility is not quite as good as what I'm used to you know there's a lot of um, incredible people that do a lot of really good work you know off the coast in the ocean out by Catalina Islands and the Channel Islands and, and stuff like that so I hear that the humpback whales are headed back up towards Monterey which is exciting and that means that the orca will be coming back to play which will be really cool so maybe uh maybe jump in the water with some orca somewhere that's definitely I, I've done it but there's definitely potential to do more and although I have a, a trip sort of plan maybe coming up towards the end of the year I'm not sure if it's still gonna work just because of what's happening um, but yeah, if they're asking from an ocean story, then yeah, somewhere, somewhere in the ocean of California would suit me just fine right now. Get on a boat and go and see some, some big sharks. Yeah, definitely. We've got the, the mobula rays are around right now. They're, um, we've been getting reports all along the coast. There. Oh, cool. Yeah, I came down with Jay when he took that photo. I think behind you, I was with him. We were in La Paz and we went and did that and it was, uh, Wow, it was so cool. Like I had no idea the, the thickness of the mobile arrays underwater. Like I just, I, I knew they bawled, but I didn't realize how many thousands of animals. I mean, it's, it's a great experience. It's, it's yeah. unbelievable. 
Yeah, so we're, we're expecting the orcas maybe to be following them pretty soon afterwards, so. Yeah, you guys got orca. I could do, I could do Mexico as well. I could do yeah, some. Yeah, come on down. <laughs> I could do some, I could do some cave diving, actually. I haven't been cave diving in a while. Um, I could uh, go back to Tiger Beach. <laughs> Tiger Beach is not a bad space to with get. no one there. Up. With no yeah, one there. So all those big girls swimming around. They're exactly. so, they're amazing. That's, my ultimate actually it's funny um i did a i did a talk like a webinar talk for my brother's my brother works um in dc and um i didn't know any of his colleagues really very well but i did a big conference call with them and had like 300 of them and their kids and all their people listening in and talking about sharks and blabbing on the way i do and um i got this really cool picture actually in the mail the other day um it's from one of the little boys he watched it I don't know if you guys can see it because the TV's yeah. up hold, hold it down a little bit. Let's yeah. see your, um, your virtual background is. There we is, go. Can you see that? Kind of, it's, yeah. kind of, it's kind of a, 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 I don't know. Anyway, it's a. Super it's cool. A, he drew me a tiger shark and he's like, to Miss Liz, thank you for the amazing video and presentation. Tiger sharks are my favorite too from Cosby. That's, That's awesome. Great. And his sister drew me a really cool rainbow, which is really sweet. But yeah, I was like, that's so rad. Like, you know, a little kid like that. That's kind of why we do it. So it's quite fun to see that. But um, really cool. Yeah, it's uh, so yeah, I could, de but I could definitely hit up some shark diving in Mexico. That'd be cool. Definitely come on down there. I mean, there's they've got to be loving it out there. I mean, we're not allowed in the ocean at all. So yeah, and I heard that today or well, the first of May, there's no shark fishing off Cabo for a period of time. Is that correct? Is that like it's um, I, there's there's no. Uh, they're 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 allowed to do um some like you're allowed to do recreational fishing um i don't know what that includes and what kind of um how, how regulated it is like right now um fishermen are allowed to go out and fish for sustenance um there's no tours or anything like that so people aren't allowed to do any recreational fishing um yeah. but you're allowed to go and like get fish for your family i don't know about the shark fishing and how regulated it is um, yeah. but I know that like, it's super, super strict. Like we're not, no one is allowed on the beach or in the water. So yeah, unless yeah. you're like a fisherman with your own boat that is going to fish for your family, like you're not allowed out in the water. Yeah. Um, so, and then as far as like where the fishing is, I don't know if there's anyone enforcing it. So, you know, that's like a big factor. It's one thing to say that there is no fishing, um, of the sharks, but then it's another thing to enforce it. So. Oh yeah. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Exactly. So, especially here. So we'll have to yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure. see how that goes. But if, if, if you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you be? Um, and that's a good question. Everyone who's watching should put in the Q and A. Yes. Like one place right now. Where it it doesn't have to be a diving trip. It doesn't have to be a diving trip. It doesn't. Uh -huh. um, this time last year, I was actually in Tiger Beach, and we were. I was just talking to my friend yesterday, and we were um, just. It was amazing. We had a crew trip there. We were just installing, like reinstalling the moorings and checking them for the um, for all the just making sure like get ready for the season and it was so it was just the crew on board and we just like went dive every day after work it was just like went diving no guests it was like the best week ever yeah it's pretty awesome um yeah there you go one of my buddies was like bahamas bahamas tiger beach yeah i see a lot of people in bahamas tiger beach need warm water right now i think i think it's still pretty cold in a lot of places in the u.s um i've been doing some courses for some people in canada um yeah, Canada's ridiculous. They're like freezing all the time. Yeah. Canada's a great country. I love it. And there's, I have some really amazing Canadian friends that, um, yeah. that are very special to me. Um, but it, it is cold. And yeah. There's sure. a lot of land up there. Yeah. Coral Bay, Western Australia. We got one person. That's for Someone sure. Someone said Rainbow Reef, Fiji. Yeah, Rainbow Reef. Yeah, I've never been there. But Coral Bay, oh man, I love Coral Bay. I used to work there. So yeah. amazing. Um, yeah, the, dive, the diving is, is pretty rad. Yeah, and they're allowed in the water there, so I What's really it? envy my friends over there. They're, like, going out every day. There's nobody nobody there. Just They're just, like, going out in the boat every day and seeing awesome stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> um, someone else said that, Komodo or the Galapagos. Mm, yeah. You know, if I was stuck on a boat diving the Galapagos for eight weeks, I'd be okay with that. I mean, you know, yeah. life's a struggle, but yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, the coronavirus is definitely uh, – 
changed a lot. Um, but, you know, as well, it's also given us some time to reflect on things that, you know, um, you know prioritize our life. And I did a webinar chat the other day and, and someone was saying, what do you think the impact will have on the environment? And um, I said, you know, I can't think that it wouldn't be positive. I mean, you're looking at images of jellyfish in the Venice Canal and dolphins in places that, you know, or, you know, species coming back in areas of the world that you know, gators walking across the street in Florida, although I think that happens fairly often. So I'm not sure if that's a big deal. But but yeah, I mean, the positivity that the, you've got to look at it from that side. And I just hope that, you know, people can walk away from this experience that we've had that's never happened before. And, you know, just take time to reflect on, on maybe some of the good that's actually happened to our planet. And it's funny, I always, I said it was so coincidental how you know, we were talking about global warming for such a huge portion of our life leading up into this, you know, we have like the upcoming US elections, which always is a huge topic, and we have global warming and the, the haters and the lovers and Gre- uh, Greta Thunberg from, you know, from Europe and all these people and all these activists doing stuff and all these really horrible statistics that are flying everywhere. And then all of a sudden the coronavirus happened and the world was able to stop and get better for a little bit. It just seemed like such a weird coincidence that it just seemed hopeless for a couple of months. Everything just seems so negative. And uh, so, um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. But you know, it's it's been really cool to um, have been here with you guys. And um, I just learned how to do a background. I've been sitting in front <laughs> of a white wall for the past yeah. couple of weeks. And now I have these cool sharks. Ooh. I read this morning that, you know, it's funny. There's a lot of people that are doing these presentations for work and they'll sit in front of their bookshelves to make themselves look like all really cool. But now there's those people, which we have in our world, that are all looking at what books they read. And apparently, um, is it Kate Blanchett, the actress? She has 20 copies of the English Dictionary on her shelf. I mean, why do you need 20 copies of the English Dictionary? And then everyone's sitting in front of, like, they, they post the books that they want you to think that you know. Like, you're not into philosophy. Don't lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> coffee you books. Care, you just like put it yeah f- all these philosophical coffee. books of like real thought and intrigue like the science behind this it's like no yeah. so, so i just have yeah. sharks because it's way more realistic um yeah. than, uh, totally than, than the oxford dictionary i would not have the oxford dictionary <laughs> totally um we, we did have a question from coral c um she says here in asia shark fin soups are still hailed as a delicacy um, I've been trying to explain to people how it's inhumane and holds zero nutritional value. Any suggestions on how I might be better a uh, better might be better to change the mindset of people around me? So yeah, I mean, again, like huge topic. Shark fin soup is is massively controversial. The problem with shark fin soup, I think, is that it's very much cultural based. So what you're doing is you're trying to change a culture as opposed to. Um, you know, something that's slightly more black and white. Um, you know, education is always the number one go-to when it comes to stuff like that. Educating the younger generations. You're not going to tell an 80-year-old man who's been doing it his whole life that's been passed down from his father, from his father, that he can no longer do it because it's bad for the environment because you're just not going to be able to do that. You've got to tackle the issue, I think, with younger people. And that's why kids are so great to work with because they're like sponges and they absorb all this information. So I would say, you know, there's been a lot of campaigns in Asia to try and prevent the use of shark fin soup. It's complete. It's like when they cook bird nest soup, they stick a nest. Why would you want to stick a nest in water and boil it? Like it's disgusting. They carry bacteria and well, hence the coronavirus. I mean, I don't need to go into all that right now, but I think education is the key and, you know, maybe hooking up with some kind of nonprofit or volunteer group that's based on the ocean. I know that Patty has a big reach when it comes to working in communities like that, as do a lot of different shark conservation, like the shark angel shark allies is another big one that does stuff um, in different parts of the world. And, and just, you know, using, trying to, trying to educate people from a younger age. And it's hard to, it's hard to change a cultural belief. That's why, you know, teaching fishermen that maybe fishing for fish is not as sustainable as taking people out to see the sharks or to see the whales. Like, you know, one dead shark was proved in the Hawaii is worth, I mean, it, sorry, it was proved in the Bahamas is worth like a hundred bucks. But within a calendar year, one shark is worth a million dollars alive because it's a tourist attraction. So people are going to come. So you're also feeding into that economic value of the country. So 
yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Education is the key. And sometimes you need to use a bigger platform that's already established. You know, every little bit counts, but sometimes you do need to do the research to find a broader and a bigger um, platform to work from and use those platforms. That's what they're there for. I mean, I think that people would only be encouraging of you to, uh, to, um, to use them to, to further knowledge and respect for the ocean and, and what it needs. Yeah. And I, and I totally agree um, on reaching the older generation through the younger generation. I know that here with the Baja fishermen, like a lot of them, you know, they, they don't want people coming to them, telling them what to do. But as soon as their, their grandchild or their kid comes to them and is like, you know, we're not going to eat this turtle soup. This turtle is amazing. Like, you know, we're going to preserve these turtles like these, you know, yeah. look, dad, these turtles are, you know, the, the, the fishermen start to think differently about the ocean as they yeah, you know it's interesting that i'm just going to interject there just because that's a really good point um i got brought down to reality very quickly once with a discussion in the bahamas they have a similar um organization called brief that monitors like you know all that kind of stuff and they do a lot of education for kids about the ocean and the environment and I went into the offices one day and there was this particular hammerhead that was up on the north side of the island that was causing the fishermen havoc. And there was all the social media about it, but they're like, we should just go out and kill it. We can't get in the water, da, da, da. And I got really angry about this. I'm like, they're going to kill a 14 foot hammerhead that's just basically in the harbor because they're throwing dead fish into the water. I mean, what do they think? So mm -hmm. I went down to brief and I'm to the head office and I was like, guys, we need to do something. They're going to kill the shark. And one of the Bahamian ladies came up to me and she said, listen, Liz, I'm going to put this really bluntly to you. And I'm like, okay, great. Let's go. And she's like, you as a white woman with blonde hair is not going to go down to Nassau Harbor and tell a bunch of local Bahamians that they cannot kill a shark because it's bad for the environment. It's not going to happen. If anything, you'll get beaten up. So I'm like, okay. She's like, we need to do this in a different way because culturally they don't understand that they can't relate to you. And it really struck me at the time, but I thought about it afterwards and I'm like, you know what, that's why it's so important to involve local communities in what you do, because it's, they're the voice of their community. They're the people who are going to be able to be relatable. Like I can make a shark relatable to a human because I am a human, but there does reach a point with that too, that, you know, it covers that, that racial, um, boundary and I had a lot of respect for her I'm like you know what that makes a lot of sense to me so maybe you can go down and tell them not to kill the shark because I don't want it to die but right. yeah I mean it, it, it is so true it's so true and I think you know an, an Asian woman in Asia telling her Asian family not to eat shark fin soup is 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 huge because it, it, it that's what we need we need those type of people to think differently to the social norm uh, to break those boundaries. It's even better if you can if you can inspire their kids and get their kids to tell their parents. Exactly, or their parents. exactly. You know, sometimes those little voices um, have a huge impact, so much more than um, you ever think possible. Right. So just getting creative and using like all of your little skills that you accumulate over a lifetime of careers and you know whatever you do over your lifetime it. it can contribute doesn't have to be in marine biology you know it's absolutely it's, it's leadership it just, takes a pa it just takes a passion for something that you love and and just totally. go with it totally well thank you so much for joining us today liz thanks for being our first coffee yeah. coffee chat um host my, um my cup is oh you can't see it my cup is yes. <laughs> awesome <laughs> yeah thank you so much and um great pleasure yeah, and I hope you get out to see those glowing oceans. I hope they drift a little bit further south to Baja California Sur so we get to see them. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it, is amazing. It, it is amazing. I mean, some of the footage has been incredible. I know that um, Outside and Good Morning America, I think, have posted some of the pictures up on their social media accounts. And yeah, um, yeah for those lucky surfers who like are prepared to get arrested to go surfing. I mean, I would. I'm just not really that good of a surfer. and. <laughs> There could be sharks in that water. I mean, come on. <laughs> Crazy surfers. <laughs> okay, man. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I hope everyone out there stays well. And, um, really yeah, take care of yourself. If you guys have any qu more questions for Liz, um, just post them on our social media and we'll direct them or uh, Liz's social media as well. And um, we'll direct them to her as well. So just let us know. But otherwise, we'll see you guys on Thursday for a chat with Tanya about uh, shark reproduction. Thank you guys so much. Take care. See you guys.